On the night Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, after he spoke of his impending betrayal, the atmosphere around the table became heavy with sorrow. The disciples were confused. In just a few hours, Jesus' suffering would begin. First in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was betrayed and forsaken by the very disciples with whom he had dined. He was made to stand before the high priest and others who hurled false accusation and insults at him. Jesus chose to have the Passover meal with his disciples right before the events of that dark night unfolded. He wanted them to know what his sacrifice would mean for them. His life laid down for theirs, and his blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Then he said to them, With desire of desire to eat this Passover, Passover with you before I suffer. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it. He gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. The Lord's Supper was in instituted in a time of darkness and sadness. And so when we are going through dark times or even good times of our own, we can partake of communion and remember Jesus and what his sacrifice means for each of us. We remember him as the bread of life who gave his body so we can have everlasting life. And he is also the sacrificial lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, we will be holy and blameless in God's eyes, loved and accepted by our Father. I'll ask the elders to pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you once again for this day. We thank you for the opportunity, truly, that we have to be back in your house this morning. Just the spirit and our emotion will work. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time we have to be in your house this morning, Lord. I praise your name today, Father, for all things. Thank you for the blessings you give us. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll, everything that you do and say here today will be in accordance to your will. Thank you, Father, for this time we have to serve you, for the help you give us to be here. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll be with us now as we come around your table. Thank you, Father, for this cup, which is your son's shed blood. Thank you, Father, for people that are here today that I've missed. Be back with us. It's good to see them. Praise them today. Praise each one here, Father. Help them to realize this is the place they need to be to serve you in every day of their life, Lord. Thank you for all you do for me. And forgive us of our sins now. It's my prayer in your son's name.
It is now time for us to give back some of the many blessings the Lord has given to us this past week. I'll ask Teddy Tipton if he would pray for the offering. Let's stand and sing, I am blessed. seated. We are dismissing to our nursery and Sunday school classes at this time. All are welcome to go down and be a part of that, especially whether you like it or not. It's good to be in the Lord's house this morning. Uh, it's good to take time. Uh, it's a blessing that when we take the time as commanded on the first day of the week to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ to worship the Lord. And make no mistake, that's what we're here for. We honor our mothers today, but we're here to serve the Lord. We're here to worship Him. Uh, and, you know, we had a good revival this past week. We had a very good revival. And one of the very last uh, proclaimers of the gospel in its entirety one of the very last that remains, Bud Gentry. He will preach the gospel, the message from God in its entirety, and he don't cut corners. And it was a blessing to have him here. Uh, we learned much if you listened. And one thing he said in his Wednesday uh, message, when he started, he said, I have noticed something here that needs to change at Sims Hill. Do you remember that? I've been paying attention. And he said, of all places I've been to at Sims Hill, you need to change nothing. That's because we sing the truth. We preach the truth. We stand up for the truth. And there is a love here for one another uh, as the church is expected to have. And uh, I thought it was a compliment from a preacher uh, to say that... Uh, you know, there's nothing bad going on here. Keep it like you've got it going. We do wish Happy Mother's Day to everyone with us that are mothers. Uh, Proverbs uh, 31 says, Her children rise and call her blessed. Now, what kind of mother was that? A lot of people don't know Proverbs 31. That was a letter written to the king. You know who it was from? His mama. Saying this is what kind of woman you're to look for. This is what kind of woman you should be raising girls to be. I'm not preaching on that, but you need to go read Proverbs 31. On what God expects a woman to be, a wife to be, and a mother to be. It's there for your reading. It's there for you to be instructed in. And I would suggest taking time to read it. So happy Mother's Day to you all. I have a wonderful mother, was raised by a wonderful mother. I have a fantastic mother-in-law. I have watched my wife become a terrific mother from a 19-year-old girl to a, well, an older lady today. Do you know the best thing about all three of them that I just mentioned to you? And I'm not coming with no joke. That's right. They're a Christian. 
My mother-in-law, and she won't care to tell you, for all of her life, that just a couple years ago was raised in the denominational church and believed it. We crossed paths many times about it. About to believe and ask Jesus in your heart and the sinner's prayer and this and that and the other. She finally decided for her best and for her family's best, she was going to do what the word of the Lord said. She repented that day and was immersed in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of her sins to become a Christian. Do you know why? Because that's what the Bible says. She's an example of a godly mother now. And that's what we all want to be. Mothers, that's what we want you to be. An example of a godly mother. Bud said one other thing while he was here. I think that uh, Jonah had given a communion meditation. Connor had just been up to preach. Kobe's been up there to preach at Dewey and around. And uh, uh, he said, uh, Bud looked down and said, Y'all must be so proud of all your boys. And we are proud. We're proud for the decisions to follow the Lord and to stay in the word as they have done it. We're proud of them. Have they been perfect? Far, far from it. For, for, although they were raised by a perfect father. <laughs> they have failed themselves and all the time being perfect, but they've been good boys. And we are blessed to have them. I've seen a million tears shed over poor decisions that they have made. But I've seen a billion tears shed because of the right things that they've done, because of their accomplishments, because of their desire to be good people. I want to talk to you about one this morning she might not have thought would be talked about on Mother's Day. There's a woman named Eve. Y'all know who she is? Eve, the mother of all living, says in Genesis, the third chapter. Now, when I bring up Eve, about everybody in here is going to think of the only Bible story, and they, they tend to want to think that the only time Eve is mentioned or brought up in a negative way. I mean, she sinned and brought the downfall of man like we have today. Uh, cancer, all sicknesses, all disease, uh, pain and suffering, heartache, death. Every bad thing you can mention exists today. The birth defects of little children. Horrific things. All because a woman named Eve sinned. And that's why they remember Eve. Of course, we know that her husband sinned too, didn't they? She partook first. She gave him to partake and he eat like an idiot. He partook too. And everything went downhill from there. That's what the Bible teaches us, right? The Bible also teaches us that throughout the Old Testament and into the New Testament, we find out that although Eve was the one that partook first, who took the blame of that in God's eyes? Adam did. He was the man. Adam was the man of the relationship. He was supposed to have stood firm. He was supposed to have stood strong, but he did not. So Adam gets the blame for all of it, but Eve sinned first, and that's all anybody remembers about the story of Eve. And I think that's a shame because the first thing I think we ought to realize when talking about Eve, she was a perfect woman. Eve was a perfect woman. How could she not be? God made her. God made her for a special purpose to be the helpmate, the partner of her man Adam. She was perfect. Nobody ever talks about Eve in that light, do they? But she had to have been perfect. No creation of God was ever imperfect. In your Bibles, go to Genesis chapter 2 with me this morning. Genesis chapter 2. Verse 18. And the Lord said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. Now look over at verse 20. And Adam gave names to all the cattle, 
to the fowl of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not a, any uh, help found for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And God took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh thereof. And the rib which the Lord had taken from Adam, man, he made woman and brought her unto him. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. She was perfect because God made her. But in everything that God did, it was good, was it not? Ah, the stars and the moons and the sun, this is good. The plants and the life in the ocean and on the land, it was good. Looked it all over and said, it's very good. God did. Except for one thing. Did you catch that there? He said, it was not good good for man to be alone so he made woman the perfect creation from God her marriage to Adam is the very basis on which every marriage today is built and Jesus said this that's not my opinion I didn't claim that for my study Jesus said that go to Matthew uh, chapter 19 Matthew chapter 19 first. The marriage is today not between a man and a man. Not between a, a woman and a woman. Not between one of this one and three of the other. Absolutely not. The Adam, the marriage between Adam and Eve is the basis for which God recognizes all marriages since that point and even today. Matthew 19, verse 4. Of course, these Pharisees come trying to tempt Jesus. And in verse 4, Jesus says, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one. Wherefore, there are no more two different fleshes, but there are one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Now we get later on over into Matthew, the 15th chapter, and we find out some people coming along thinking you could just throw away your wife, get rid of them for any reason whatsoever. We also go on in Matthew, the 15th chapter, to find out that sometimes when people got married, they forsook their mother and father, which is not what the New Testament teaches. For if you just throw your mother and father away and your family away because now you're married and you've got a job and you've got responsibilities, you go and throw your whole family away, you broke one of the Ten Commandments. You know that? And it's the only commandment with promise. And it says, honor your father and your mother, what? That your days might be long, that you have a long life. Nothing in the Ten Commandments about marriage, about a job, about raising children, about any of the things, popularity. Nothing in the Ten Commandments about it, but it does say, honor your mother and your father. To what point? Well, apparently the prodigal son thought it was time that he come of age. Been around mom and daddy, he was too good for that anymore. Too good for his brother. Too good to work on the farm. Too good to do the things that he'd been raised and trained to do. He hit the road. Had his friends. Had new people he considered family that were really unrighteous, unholy people. Took right up with them. How'd life go for that person? When you forsake your mama, when you forsake your mama, you got bad times are coming. Oh, he partied and had a good time for a while. And we know this story. We read it, and Daddy was sitting out there waiting on him to come back home, wasn't he? And it never talks about the mama, though, does it? Was the, did the woman, had she existed? She had to be crushed, did she not? Crushed. 
It wasn't so much the lifestyle that he went out to live and the wrong things he would have done as if nothing else. More importantly, he broke a commandment of God. And he did not honor his mother and his father. I said in the prayer circle back here, you know, I think of Chris's mama. Where you at, Chris? I pointed where you usually sit. All right. don't, don't move on me, man. <laughs> and I've heard about Linda's mama. I know about my mama's mama. Joyce Nan has talked about her mama. Honoring your mother and father doesn't stop when they die. If you was raised by a good, godly Christian mother, you should honor them after their death by the way in which you live. Adam and Eve's marriage, a model for our marriages today. But was she a perfect mother? And the answer to that is no. No, she wasn't a perfect mother. But she couldn't have been all that bad neither. A lot of people talk about this <laughs> stuff like if that was my child, if that was my kid, I'd do this and I'd do that and I'd have this that way and that that way. I'd be a perfect parent. The only perfect parent that exists is a person that has no actual children. They're all perfect parents. Because we come to find out once we have children, we're not so perfect at raising them. And neither was Eve. Let's look at her first son, Cain. Boy, he was a character, wasn't he? He's hard-headed and stubborn. He refused to offer the sacrifices of which he knew he was supposed to make. He blamed his brother for his problems and his shortcomings. Had a temper problem, like I said. And then, of course, we know the story. He killed his brother. Killed his brother. Tried to hide it. When God said, where's your brother at? He's like, huh, am I my brother's keeper? Won't you go find him yourself? How am I supposed to know where he is every day? Cain had some problems. In Cain, Eve had failed as a mama. Somewhere along the way. Don't know exactly how. But then we see the flip side of that. Abel was a great son. The book of Hebrews mentions him and says even though he is dead, he, now, he continues to speak today because he had faith and he offered the proper sacrifice to God. So she didn't fail there. Then she had a third son. Do y'all know what his name was? Seth. Under Seth at the time of Seth, can you tell me what it was all people began to do at the time of Seth? They, they started to call on the name of the Lord. They started to worship God as God with Seth and at Seth's time. He was so important, I imagine, that God mentioned him in uh, the lineage of Jesus Christ. Backed him all the way up to Seth, the son of Adam. So she couldn't have been all that bad of a mama. Two of those boys that I just mentioned done very, very good. Yeah, Cain was an idiot. Yeah, he is an embarrassment. But the next two boys turned out to be pretty good. We learn from the story of Eve, and there wasn't no question about this at the time. She was a woman. There seems to be questions about that today. Are you really a woman? Are you imagined to be a woman? Are you proclaiming yourself a woman? But you're not. You know, all kinds of concerns today. She was a woman. Because that's all, God only made a man and a woman. He didn't make any freak. He didn't make anything in between. You can't decide tomorrow that you're going to be something different gender-wise than you are today. God made you the way he made you. And he made a woman. Just like every woman here today. Let me tell you what, women. You ought to be proud to be a woman. 
You should be proud. I am proud to be a man, you know. Not in a sinful way. I'm, God made me what I am and I'm proud of that. I will not be seeking tomorrow any changes. I will not consider myself something tomorrow than what God made me and that I am today. And neither did Adam and Eve. Neither did anybody with a lick of sense. They were what God made them. A woman and a sinner. God made them a woman. Or her a woman. But she become a sinner. Just like every one of us here today. Male or female. God has made us. And because of our choices, we have become sinners at a point in our lives. We made bad decisions. Women have made bad decisions just like Eve made a bad decision. Those bad decisions have hurt some of your all's families greatly. And some of your past family, they were hurt greatly by bad decisions of the mama. Same thing went on with Eve and same thing will continue to go on. Because we're prone to sin. Now here's something to remember. Eve was a model child of God at one time. She dressed the way God told her to dress. She made, they, they tried the little leaf. He made them skins to put on, clothing to put on. Do you remember that? It wasn't a cool thing to be naked or halfway naked or two-thirds of the way naked. He made them clothes that covered them. And she was fine with that. Or, or had to be after because she had a lot of responsibility. But before her sin, she was a model child of God. Everything went smoothly for her. Until she started listening to a new little friend, right? What was that friend's name? Yeah. Anybody that tries to direct you away from the ways of God and the truths of God, these little friends that come along, their, their last name is always Satan. And this is her new little friend in the garden. I'll become telling her, you're really missing out on life. God just don't want you to be like he is. He's trying to keep you under his control and unhappy when all you got to do is go eat of that tree there in the middle of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's what her little friend was telling her. And she went and listened to the little friend. And look what we got in the world today. Look what we've had for the last 4,000 some years. Heartache. Because a woman listened to a little friend. She shouldn't have touched what she touched. She shouldn't have eat what she ate. She shouldn't have ignored the word of God. Think of the number of people. And I thought about this while I was going through this. The number of women that will stand with their children. Listen to me. The number of women that will be there with their children and grandchildren and maybe hundreds or thousands of years worth of family that come after her, I'll stand before God and be told, depart, I never knew you because they refuse to be obedient to God's word. Imagine that. Imagine that, mothers, that you end up one of those mothers that guides your family into an eternity in hell. Boy, that's going to be something, isn't it? Because you, like Eve, refuse to obey the word of God. You all have got a great responsibility just like us men do, but your responsibility is greater, and that is to lead a family, to protect, to nourish that family. And the most important in nourishment is the word of God. Eve done some things she didn't have done. Her biggest thing was to ignore what God's word said. She lost. She lost her home. She lost her closeness that she once had with Adam. She lost the closeness she had with God. She lost all the joy that she once had because she went against the word of God. And her sin didn't just hurt her. 
It hurt her husband. It hurt her family to come and for all families for the rest of time because she ignored only one part of the Word of God. How many of you think, well, I don't have to do all the Bible says I can get by with that or believe like my mom and daddy did. As long as I got all the rest of it okay, I'll be okay then. How many of y'all feel that way this morning? It's a good thing because all Eve did was one thing that God told her not to do. And look where we are today. But don't just remember that about Eve. Remember everything good about Eve. She was a woman, just like every woman here. She faced many of the conflicts and the same bad choices that all of us here have faced. But she had to have been a pretty good mom. We read that these boys worked out in the field. Right? They had livestock. Some worked in the planting and bringing forth crops. I don't know about you. I've dabbled in that. <laughs> it's hard work. It's hard work, isn't it? Unhealthy wimps ain't out there doing that kind of work, are they? Somebody had to been planning what to do for breakfast and having the lunches ready for the next day and then working to get everything straightened up and put back in order for supper that night, right? These were healthy men working out in the field. That means they had a good mama. No doubt they come in needing clothes made, needing clothes rent, they were rent to put back together and sewed and fixed and prepared for the next day's work. No doubt there were accidents, John. No doubt there was sickness that had to be tended to. These men were able to continue on and to go and to be strong and to do. Had to have been because Eve was a pretty good mama. They had what they needed. I've heard people say with their chest point bulged out, I never asked my mom or daddy for a thing. If any of my boys ever come up and say that to you, I want you to take your fist, <laughs> make it as hard as you can, and knock them straight to the ground. What they should have come up and said, and better come up and said, and said I never had to ask my mom or daddy for a thing. Because by the grace of God and their love for me, I had everything of what I needed and way beyond. And that's the way a good godly mother is. Proverbs 31 backs me up in this. Their children arise up and call her blessed. Why? Because they pro she's provided them with everything that they need. There ain't no wants. Even her husband's pleased with her. Because she works, bart, nonstop, for the family. Mary, do you know that I do you know that feeling? Yeah, you do. Like a lot of you other women in here, you've worked nonstop for your family. You know why you did that? Because God expects it of you. He made the woman perfect. And in that they sought well to their households. Proverbs thirty one. Being a mama's hard work, goodness. But listen, God never meant for women to raise the, the children, take care of the house and everything all by herself. That's the way God intended it. God put man as head of the household. But boys, right there turning that neck, or turning that head is the neck, right? And that neck is the woman. She's helping direct and she's doing her part. So that everybody there has what I need, what they need. I had to skip around the amount of time. Did you know that after Eve had sinned, pretty big sin, that God still loved her? Did you know that? We read that after their sin, John, that God, the presence of God come into the garden like he did every day. He said, Adam, where you all at? And they'd gone over there and they'd hid because they were naked. He said, well, we're kind of hiding over here because we're naked. God said, how'd you know you're naked? Somebody eat of that tree that I told them not to? Somebody disobey me? And they had. 
And then that's the point. After all, they get, you're going to, this is what you're going to, this is what's going to happen, this is what's come to you. You should have listened and obeyed me. After all that, we learned that he made them skins out of animals to wear. Now, if he'd made them skins from animals, what had happened to the animals? They, were, they died. They were sacrificed. God sacrificed those animals that he may clothe their nakedness, that he may cover their sin. That's what their nakedness was all about. That's what it was, was their sin, you see. That's the reason they knew they were naked, because they'd sinned. And after they had been reprimanded, after everything had changed, God sacrificed the animals that it took to make the skins to cover their nakedness, the skins to cover their skin. God made the first sacrifice ever on the face of the earth. And he made the last sacrifice to cover man's sins. And that was Jesus Christ on the cross. He offered Jesus Christ to die for our sin. To cover our sin just like he covered Adam and Eve's sin in the beginning. As he covered their nakedness, so he offered Jesus Christ to cover ours. And to take away the sins of the whole world is why Jesus Christ died. That's why he came. But a lot of people today are like those scribes and Pharisees in Jesus' time. Now, I really want you to listen to me now. I really want you to listen to me because you can't, I don't want you to stand before God and say, well, I had never heard that. I didn't know the Bible said that. You listening? He gave us Jesus to die for our sin. Many people today are like the scribes and Pharisees. They will not receive the words of Jesus Christ himself. After Jesus' death and resurrection, before he ascended into heaven, he told the disciples to go out and to preach and to teach. And those that believe, they were to be what? Baptized, immersed. Jesus says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. You can't leave out either one of them. On the day of Pentecost, when the people said, what shall we do? Peter said, repent, be immersed. Why? For the remission of sins, not to join the church. You're not baptized to join the church. You're not baptized because Jesus was baptized. You're baptized to have your sins washed away. I bring it up all the time. About everybody in here, raise your hand if you know Romans 10, 9 and 10. Raise your hand if you know exactly what that says. Boy, ain't a lot of you. Y'all need to do some studying. Because it's all over the roads everywhere. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart. You shall be saved. I believe I'm going to get home, but I've got to go out here and do some things in this car to get me there, right? It's so funny that people have Romans 10, 9. They've got it padded right out. They know exactly what it says, but they skip the whole sixth chapter of Romans. As if it, don't, as if it goes Romans 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 9, 10. Romans, the sixth chapter is in there. And Paul reminds Christians what they did to be saved. He said, do you not remember that every one of you that were baptized were baptized into Jesus Christ and that in baptism the old man of sin was put to death? You are raised from what? Baptism to walk in newness of life. Not one time did he point to the thief on the cross. Not one time did you say, say a little prayer. Not one time did you say, go be baptized because Jesus was baptized or baptized to show the outward appearance of an inward changed life. No, that's all that little friend Satan whispering in ears. And mamas are going to stand there by the millions with their sweet little children and grandchildren and long lineage of families. And because they wouldn't turn to the Word of God and do what it says, they all going into eternity in hell. And that's not my words. Jesus will say, don't call me Lord, Lord. You didn't do what I said. Depart from me. I never knew you, you worker of iniquity. You know why you don't know him, John? Because they never repented and were baptized into him to be saved. Jesus said, the only way to God is through me. And the only way to Jesus Christ, Galatians 3, 3.27, is when we're immersed into him. Amen? Amen? That's the Bible. Few believe it. 
is the reason few, Jesus says, will be saved in the end. Mother or father, single, married, young, old, male, female. It doesn't matter. We all get to God the same way, and that's through the blood of Jesus Christ. You can be the greatest mother on the face of the earth if you die outside the Lord and you raise your children outside the Lord, you can raise them all kinds of things. To be. They, they, they can go to church every Sunday. They can, they can sacrifice and tithe every Sunday. If you haven't raised them according to the entirety of the New Testament Scripture, you've raised them outside the Lord. To be guilty against one part of the law is to be guilty against all of it, it says in James. So let me ask you a question. If today the Lord comes back, will you go to heaven because as a sinner you humbled yourself to repent and the same hour you straightway came and you were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins to receive the indwell of the Holy Spirit? If the Lord come back today, would you stand with your family and say that, be able to say that in your family too? Jesus says few would be able to. Few. And you don't need to be a part of that few because you're here today and you've heard the word of God. I know what John 3.16 says. I know it like the back of my hand. And I know what John 3.16 was in reference to. You ought to read the John 3 before you get to verse 16 help you understand what 3.16 is all about. You can't just use that as a plan of salvation. I'm trying to open your eyes that you don't make the same mistake that Eve made over and over and over and over again. I believe this. I believe Eve helped raise her boys in the way of the Lord. I believe that. Cain knew how to sacrifice properly. Somehow did he not? And when you got that many children, when the majority are doing right, mom and daddy are usually behind that. There's, there, there's, there's things to back that up today. In high crime areas, and where a lot of juvenile delinquency is, do you know what the one thing the home is missing in all of those situations? A father. Do you know that? When a father or mother are together and they're raising their children based on that, they're not perfect, but the Word of God is. And it'll lead them to heaven. And lead them to a fulfilled life here. Don't you want that for your family? And for your future families? Then obey the word of God. We'll sing a hymn of invitation. The first verse of our invitation hymn. And we ask that you don't put off the direction of God's word. You don't ignore him like Eve did that one time. Because you may damn a whole lot of people around you that comes after you. And wouldn't that be awful to have to answer for that? when today you can make the right decision and be saved the way Jesus died for you to be saved. We'll stand and sing verse 1.